This meeting is being recorded. Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, Dr. Bhima Dash Kapukia Dijnaka Salgin Dunjaba, Jikan Dodem. Welcome to Winter Concordia's Indigenous Winter Storytelling Series. Um, it's hosted by the First People Studies Program uh, with financial support from the Faculty of Arts and Science. And so I'd like to shout out to Dr. Richardson, our principal, um, Dr. Sheftel, and um, Dean Pascal. Thank you very much for supporting this uh, um, storytelling series. And I'll start with a territorial acknowledgement. So Concordia would like to begin by acknowledging that the university is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganyang Gehaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Uh, Jijake or Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many, many First Nations peoples. Today, it's home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections of the past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. I'd like to acknowledge um, that we are in the territory of um, the dish with one spoon. And so you can learn a ton about the events that led up to this um, powerful agreement that continues to govern these lands today. Uh, you can also read about uh, the Great Peace of Montreal of 1701 to give you some further information about uh, the dish with one spoon. Um, so my name is Bima Dash Kapukian. I am from Saugeen and we are Anishinaabe. Uh, I have a PhD in anthropology, uh, certified uh, and, and master's of public health. And my undergraduate degree is in psychology and first nation studies. So I'm an assistant professor at Concordia, the faculty of arts and science. I'm cross appointed between the school of community and public affairs as well as the Department of History. And my research is housed at the Center of Oral History and Digital Storytelling uh, at Concordia. You can read about my work if you Google up the Anishinaabeg of Chiefs Point. You can read my dissertation. It's available free online. Anybody can read it. Um, and I have lots of sources, lots of pictures. You'll really, really enjoy it. You can also check out my media presence. And so you can read about me or even watch um, a mini documentary that was made about my work at, uh, you can find that at TVO. Um, and here you can see I'm showing uh, an article produced by, um, written by Mary Baxter, really great lady over at TVO. Um, and yeah, and you can also check out, like I said, the, the mini documentaries, about seven minutes, really quick, but you can hear the, the recordings that I digitized, wax cylinders, um, and it's through, archival research, reading old books, really fully engaging um, meaningfully with research and being out on the land, talking with elders, working with community within um, like between institutions. Uh, and it just really, really turned out to be an extremely successful project. So I encourage you to check out my work. And so that brings me to why this is really important that we're offering the storytelling series. Uh, here I've selected a few archival sources for you, you can find this in Library and Archives Canada. And I'm showing you this because this is a big reason of why we stopped telling our stories. So Googling, um, you know, searching within Library and Archives Canada, you will find many, many accounts. Um, here I'm showing you one that's recorded as starvation and destitution among the Indians and Eskimos of Labrador. Um, screenshot this. If you know how to screenshot, screenshot this right now. Here you can see I'm circling it right now. This is how you're going to find this document. Even including some of these keywords in the search, you will pull this up. Here's another one I've located down here. It's from British Columbia, and it's uh, discussing the report in the Toronto Empire newspaper um, concerning um, starvation um, in British Columbia, and that claiming that this report was untrue. As well, you'll find in these the government response to starvation of Indigenous peoples in this country. Just the, the excuses that are given, blaming it on the geographical location of people, the inability to get supplies to these communities. 
um, that Indian Affairs isn't responsible, Indian Affairs is responsible. It's really pathetic and disgusting to read this and it really breaks my heart, but I'm encouraging you to go and look for yourselves, learn our history of this country. Here I've also included a record from James Bay. This was extremely upsetting for me to find this uh, during my undergrad. And here this document's talking again, um, where a nun has been, um, a nun was writing to the Canadian government calling attention to the starvation that was happening among the people in Moussini. She could not get a response and instead writes to the Queen of England. The Queen writes to the Canadian government says, what is going on over there? And the government, the government responds by saying, this is a cultural um, artifact of, of the Indigenous people. They believe in something called Wendigo, and this is just part of their culture. There is no problem. And so if our stories, when we tell our stories, when we've worked with researchers in the past, with academics, they've taken our knowledge and have twisted it and have used it to their benefit and made Indigenous people look inferior and have blamed us for the treatment that has occurred at the, the hands of the government. And so I really call your attention to the archives um, and as well, we're here today to balance that and to start retelling our stories again from our communities, from our own people's mouths. And so I'm really, really happy that my friend Richard Wesley, uh, who's a traditional ecological knowledge keeper from Constance Lake First Nation, he's here to tell us today um, some really, really cool stories from his territory. And so just a little bit about um, Richard. So you may have, you might recognize him, but you might not. Um, I'm gonna try and screen share something else. So just give me a second, because I'm really terrible at pressing the buttons and talking at the same time. Okay, I wanna show you this really cool thing. So uh, here's a news article, um, CBC Radio. You can hear an interview with Richard Bree talks about um, his lengthy education on the land, lifelong education. And in fact, where he, it's his knowledge that saved, I think saved him from this bear attack. Let's check it out. Fuck me. Should have started a long time ago. Scare me, that guy. No, I'm going to share. Um, I'll go back to my PowerPoint. Just hang on a sec. Oops. There we go. This one. Okay. I hope you can see my PowerPoint again where it's got bear attack on top. So yeah, that's where you can read um, read about Richard's experience. Um, you can also hear the interview as well um, on CBC Radio. And so here's a picture of Richard's family, his dad and his son. And really, I just wanted to sh share this picture because for me, it really demonstrates that that intergenerational knowledge um, transmission. Um, that it's you know it's a family affair living out in the bush, um, living off the land, and that you know. It's really working together as a team uh, that ensures people 
survive through um, harsh and pretty terrible winters. So where is Constance Lake? You can see here's Montreal at the bottom, Constance Lake up here in Northern Ontario. And sort of from this perspective, you can see then that Constance Lake is the center of the universe. And Richard's gonna tell us all about um, what that's like. And then just to get a better sense of what the land is like, um, and you know who is where kind of a thing. So here we have like the river system and Constance Lake is what I'm circling right now. But you can also see that there's close relationship over here. There's a province of Manitoba, down here you have United States and over here Quebec. And so we can imagine then that the relationships between people, the sharing of stories um, and even you know some shared language that, that we're gonna see a lot of that too when we start to branch out and listen to different stories from different communities. And so when Richard and I were, were talking about um, this session in particular, uh, Richard offered up this book that he really um, enjoys and relies on um, and revisits. So it's called Sacred Legends of the Sandy Lake Cree. So certainly these are Cree stories, but like I showed you in the map before, people are living fairly close together. So there's lots of shared stories between them. And then I also really like to rely on Basil Johnson because I come from Saugeen and, and, and Basil was from Cape Croker which is really close to my community. And so I really rely on, you know, lots of his writings, the Manitous. Um, and so I encourage you to pick up both of these books um, and read further into um, some of our old stories. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Richard, who's gonna tell us um, some Wendigo stories. All right, Richard, it's all yours. I'm gonna stop sharing. Alrighty. Hello, everybody. <laughs> As uh, Anya introduced me, and my name is Richard. I'm uh, Oji Cree Odawa. My mother's Odawa from Manitoulin Island, Ontario. My dad's Oji Cree from Northern Ontario, uh, way, way up here. The uh, wintertime storytelling, uh, I remember as kids, mom would share a lot of the stories from the island. And uh, there was kind of hair raising some of them because they're shape shifting. Uh, borderline with Windigo stories. And uh, <clears throat> when Andy asked me to do this, I was thinking back. I remember uh, we had the option of going to Cree class or uh, French when we went to grade school. So I tried to go to a French class and uh, well, it didn't work out so well. <laughs> so uh, I went into the Cree class and I remember uh, Angela Moore was our teacher and she said, uh, Almost all of the Wendigo stories are related to keeping your children safe, keeping the children close to you. That's that's be, uh, what I remember from her stories when I was a kid. <clears throat> My dad was a hunter, trapper, gatherer. Uh, like in between his full-time work, we were always out in the bush on his trap line. And dad, he said, these stories are out there. They're, some of them are real. Some of them... They're uh, mythical. So again, he reiterated the fact that they didn't want children to go too far away from the home, right? Get lost in the bush and whatnot. But he says, as a hunter and a trapper, you cannot, how do you, you can't really believe too much in them because you'd be scared to go in the bush. And then he, he would look at me and my brothers and say, some of these stories are really scary. If you choose to believe them, you're not going to be able to come out here. You have to really tune in. Nature, right? <clears throat> and saying that, I talked to uh, a couple of elders, uh, worker healers that uh, I work with. One, his name is Paul Schilling from uh, Chippewas of uh, Nijikening, which is in Rama, Ontario. And another one is Jules Tapas. He's uh, originally from Moose Factory, Ontario. He's, uh, I think he resides in Timmins, Ontario now. Does a lot of uh, healing work with uh, our uh, sick nation, right? I'm gonna start with uh, Paul's version of the Windigo. I, I thought it was pretty interesting. We, I talked to him on the phone one evening and uh, I asked him about his version of the Windigo. <clears throat> and he, he goes back to how the Windigo comes in the winter, the big uh, blizzardy nights where the wind's howling. It's a, like, it's a horrible, horrible evening. Uh, like ours last night, the wind was blowing like crazy last night. My, uh, I'm gonna break away here, but I'm tanning deer hides right now. And I had one outside frozen flat on the ground. And when I came home, it was across the street. So it must've looked like a flying carpet. <laughs> That's how bad the winds were up here. <laughs> Anyways, back to uh, 
the wind to go, he would come in the howling winds of winter time. And uh, he voracious appetite, uh, turned into a human cannibalistic, uh, the crave for human flesh, stealing their families and killing them and eating them. They're pretty, uh, when you read these stories, they're kind of uh, borderline scary and it makes you really wonder <clears throat> what happened to them, right? To these stories that like I've never heard them for a while. So going back to Paul Schilling's uh, interpretation of President, uh, not residential school, the uh, Windigo, he says the Windigo came around a lot and said he believes the Windigo is the colonization of countries, as he believed indigenous were not the only ones that were colonized, and a lot of other countries suffer the same fate. And he says the residential school is probably one of the biggest windigos that ever came into our territory because they stole the children. He said they stole all the children. Most, most of the children they could find, they were stolen, which is what the windigo would do, right? He would attack the native black children. <clears throat> he says, and it's still ongoing to this day with uh, children's family services stepping in and taking the children out of uh, family homes. Whether it be good or bad, he says it's still the Wendigo is still present in these uh, form of the residential school, which uh, fortunately has uh, stopped. And now we have the child uh, family care where they're stealing children. That was his version of it. He was, he believes, and he's another worker helper, helper that believes now we must grasp onto our traditional healing roots and uh, the bringing back of the drum, the peace pipe, and our ceremonies, which were basically stolen from us and uh, beat out of a lot of us. Which, um, like personally, I wasn't beat, but my father was beat not to teach these. And so we lost them for years. And now we're doing, uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job of bringing them back. I, uh, I'm glad they're coming back. <clears throat> the other Windigo story is uh, from my friend Jules. We sat in told me of this one, which I found was really, uh, really interesting. He talks about three medicine men, they're three brothers. They're, he said, long time ago, medicine men were really, really powerful, medicine men and medicine women. They would, uh, like, these are, they're like 20 times as powerful as our medicine people today. They could fly, they could bounce off trees, they could cover great distances. <clears throat> so these three brothers heard of, uh, there was four Wendigos and they were attacking villages around the area, uh, killing them, eating them, causing great havoc on uh, various uh, villages <clears throat> within the area. So the brothers sat down and they did their ceremonies and they said, we, we must use our courage and bravery to try to get rid of these Wendigos, right? So they discussed what they're going to do and they discussed and the first brother says, well, I'll go first. I'm the eldest and I'll go first. So he went on to fight these Wendigos. And unfortunately, he wasn't strong enough, he wasn't uh, able to kill the Wendigos. So the Wendigos killed him. So the next brother steps up and says, I'll do it. I have to do it. He goes on to fight these Wendigos as well. And unfortunately, he died as well. So the last brother is sitting there. He's a well, I know I was quicker than my brothers. I would never have told them this while they're alive, but I know I was, I know I'm quicker than my brother. So he lures the Wendigos in one by one by one. And he's so fast that he could break them up into different, like instead of just one, there's uh, four of them separate. <clears throat> this is how he was able to kill the Wendigos uh, when he caught them one on one. So as he was killing the fourth one, he was, uh, so sad that his brothers were gone that he wasn't able to rejoice, but he felt that there was something else coming. And these four Wendigos, their father, sensed that there was something going on with his son. Like he was the most powerful Wendigo of the area. And he's, he knew something was going on with his son, like somebody was killing him. So way he comes, he's come to look for them and he wants to find out what's going on. As he gets closer with his uh, supernatural, powers and stuff, he realizes that somebody's killing his son. Now he's on uh, vengeance, he wants to kill this person, right? So the third brother, he's, uh, he leads him out onto the lake because Wendigos don't like water. 
and he uh, cuts a big hole in the ice and he uh, <clears throat> covers it up with branches and stuff and he, wait, he sits down and waits, goes into prayer and praying. There's about probably a two, two to three day wait. He's sitting there waiting, waiting. He knows the Wendigo is watching him. And the Wendigo is so powerful. He's, he's watching him as well from the shoreline. He wants to know what, what this guy is doing that killed his son, right? Finally, the Wendigo can't take it anymore. He's going to go and kill this man that killed his son. He takes off on the ice. The Wendigos travel real fast. They, like the howling wind, they go, he comes across the lake and falls into this hole in the ice. And the third brother jumps up with a log pole and he starts pushing him under the water. It's going to drown. Pushing him down. It takes a long time. As the Wendigo was finally dying, the Wendigo grabbed up and grabbed his hand and the log that he was pushing underneath. And the Wendigo tells him, He's your, you may have got us. You have finally killed our physical form. But I'll tell you one thing, the Wendigo tells him, we will return, but not in a physical form. We will come back more powerful than ever before and we will wreak havoc on everybody. You'll see what, you'll see as time goes on. So, like, all these stories are, they're old stories, right? So, Jules is telling me, well, now we see the Wendigo's return. He's the biggest one in his community and my community right now is the uh, addiction to narcotics, uh, the opium. And it's, it's so huge right now. <clears throat> Jules tells me the Wendigo is so powerful that he will actually make parents sell their children. And the Wendigo is the stealer of children. It's in, so important now for everybody, all of us to join together, uh, educators, healers, workers, bring back the pipe ceremony, bring back that healing ceremony. We started uh, sharing circles here probably uh, three weeks ago. My community is hurting bad. Uh, we have a COVID outbreak along with blastomycosis outbreak, as well as their narcotic problem, right? So I really think Jules' version is uh, something that's taking place nowadays. It's uh, the Wendigo is here. He's come back. And uh, even in reading the Basil Johnson book, he refers to that at the end of uh, his chapters and how modern day technology, as in corporations, there's no, uh, there's no stopping in the greed, right? They just want to take and take and take and take. They don't look at what what happens uh, as they take so fast. They don't look at other things that are, that are happening. <clears throat> and uh, as a caretaker of the land up here, we're out in the bush a lot. Me and my brother went out the other day to uh, observe our trap line. The, the logging mills cut out like miles, square miles. I want to say the one zone of ours, it's probably a 30 square mile cut, which is big. It used to take them probably all winter to cut that out. Now they cut that out in, I'd say, three weeks to a month. The land is gone. It's barren, right? They, uh, they claim they don't strip cut or clear cut. I beg to differ. If you, if you take a ride and look, it's, um, I actually bring a tear to your eye. <clears throat> so the, when we went out and did a survey of our land, we are on our way back. And we probably did about... 250 kilometers in a ride and I told my brother I said it's pretty sad when you take a ride this long in the bush and you see one bird which is a whiskey guy and we see one squirrel track and we see one fox. I said Larry remember even 10 years ago when we take a ride you'd see numerous birds you'd see birds all over the place rabbit tracks probably bumping probably six to ten foxes at a time see four or five lynx like all over the place he said, yeah, it is sad, said, but what, what can we do with that? Because everybody's stuck in catch-22 of uh, chasing that. We're stuck in our consumer age, right, where we have to work. We can't stop everything. What are we going to do? <clears throat> so the Wendigo is here. I, I believe that uh, my primary focus on the Wendigo is the, uh, the drug problem. It's uh, hurting our people really bad. That's mental health. Going back to Paul Schilling's story as well, it's uh, the residential school system. I've been healing for the last five years. My dad went, was kidnapped when he was six years old and taken to a residential school system. 
Uh, he only opens up a bit on what happened to him there. Uh, one of the things that really sticks to my mind is this. Richard, if you wonder why I'm such a hard man, they created that in me. There was no feeling soft in the school. If you did, uh, they just beat you harder. So I'm still healing from it. I'm glad I am. I'm partaking a lot of our ceremonies. Uh, we do probably like, uh, at least three times a week, we do sharing circles, We're trying to get everybody involved uh, to promote uh, self love with our toxic people. Uh, or the situations, people aren't toxic, but the situations and their trauma, background trauma is what makes things toxic. Another uh, story that I'd like to share is from my uh, late mother-in-law, uh, Lillian Chichu. She was born and raised in the bush as well, uh, East Maine, Quebec, up on, she married a man from East Factory, Ontario. And their trap line was uh, on the borders of Quebec and Ontario, like in the middle of nowhere. It was amazing to hear her story. So she said one winter we're up there chopping two brother uh, the two brothers um her husband's name was william and her brother uh his brother they joined together two families to chop together to help each other out and he says in the middle of winter all of a sudden we couldn't catch any animals to to eat it came like a dry spell just, and she there was uh, i remember richard she said, it was so windy for like five days just constant wind constant wind and then all of a sudden we started taking sick she was the first, the uh, two oldest children got sick. They couldn't, everything that we knew, like natives always have their medicines that they carry with them. We tried those, we couldn't help them. All of a sudden, my husband got sick. Everybody was starting to get sick. It's going on for two weeks. Now they're deathly ill, like they're high fevers and whatnot. The other, uh, William's brother, <clears throat> he says, oh, Lillian, we have to make uh, a shaking tent, which is one of the ceremonies that... Uh, our uh, Anishinaabe people use our creek people. So they put a shaking tent up. And Lillian was one of the few that was still uh, not so sick to remember all of this and help them out. So she helps him erect the shaking tent. He's there. I have to go into the shaking tent <clears throat> to fight whatever is bothering us. It could be when they go, it could be another spirit, but we have to, I have to do this. So Lillian was uh, set it up. And he says, no matter what, don't let anybody come in the tent. Even yourself, even if it sounds like something is happening. This is that he started, he was chanting and chanting. He started off in the early evening. So I don't know how long he was in there because I fell asleep. The next morning I got up, come out of the lodge, and he was the tent was all uh, broken down and he was laying on the ground wrapped up in his uh, the tent covering. So I went running over to make sure he was alive and he was breathing. I helped him get up and bring him into the lodge and warm him up. And was, she said he was all covered in huge scratches on his back, on his chest. She said, but there was none on his face, but his back was like, like a great big animal was scratching him down the back. And then she said he healed. It took about two days for everybody to heal up. And the sickness was gone. She said, just like that. It was like whatever he battled in the shaking tent, <clears throat> they took the sickness with him when he, when he defeated them, right? So this is another story, but this, uh, I believe Lillian, she was a really good woman. This is a true encounter of a ceremony in the bush of how she can help chase away Wendigo. She said, she doesn't positive it was Wendigo. She said there was a spirit there that was really harming her. She said, uh, everybody was almost going to be You know, she told me that story one, and, and storytelling happens uh, during, like last night, we had a howling windstorm here. Like my shovel, which is pretty heavy, was across the yard into the like, neighbor's yard. These are the nights where a lot of these storing telling took place. I think it was meant to enforce the young ones not to take off from home because they're when they get into them, some of them are pretty scary if they're cold in the evening. I used to think they're scary as heck when I was a kid, right? Another one I'd like to share is um because the windigo is related to shapeshifters and skinwalkers. And in all forms of medicine, even our modern day medicine, we have good medicine and we have bad medicine, right? And, uh, unfortunately, we do have people that will practice bad medicine and they could shape shift to the harm. Good medicine, you shape shift to busy people to, uh, to do good medicine. But my mom remembers on uh, Manitoulin Island, she says the family was getting attacked and uh, 
you know, as children, we're, we're listening to her and it wasn't until we were older, we, we'd ask her, what, what do you mean by attack? And she says, well, if somebody was trying to witch the family, they're coming in to do bad medicine on it. All of a sudden, <clears throat> there's no more water coming up from the wells. Uh, people are getting sick. Well, like, oh, okay. You know, you're a teenager, you're a little skeptical. And she says, all of a sudden, your Uncle John was outside in the porch. They had a big wraparound porch in the farmhouse. And he came running in and he told uh, the nook mess, which is grandmother, there's uh, somebody at the end of the driveway. So the, my grandmother ran out with the older boys, my mom says, and there's a great big owl sitting at the end of the driveway on a pole down there. And she was doing, my grandmother was a medicine woman. She did her chant and she told my brother, you have to try to chase that owl away, even if you have to shoot it. So my Uncle John went and grabbed a 22 and he shot at this owl. And it looked like they hit it because when it took off flying, it went down towards the ground and it would come back up. It was flying like it was injured. And so uh, my older uncles, they uh, chased it as far as they could. And they lost sight of it. They couldn't find it anymore. So the next day, uh, everything was by a horse carriage back then on Manitoulin Island. There's no cars, right? So they got wind that. There was a woman way down towards South Bay, which is in, which, uh, I guess, uh, would say the back 40s. <clears throat> they got wind that she was dying. Looks like uh, somebody did harm to her, but she was known as a, a shapeshifter. She could shapeshift, and people were worried over the reputation she had that she practiced bad medicine. So my grandmother took off with my Uncle John with the bug and the horse and buggy, and they went to sea. And when they went to the house, this lady was uh, dying on her deathbed and she had a big hole in her chest, like a bullet, bullet wound, right? You know, these stories, when they tell you these when you're a child, you're like, I was fathomed by like, wow, like, no way. Like, this is real stuff. We hear about it in movies. And my mom said this was really alive, especially on Manitoulin Island, where uh, the Nishnabe name for Manitoulin Island is Nidona Singh, right? The Island Experience. The first time Manitoulin Island was burnt, they burnt it on purpose. It was a man-made fire to try to burn all the spirits off of it. The second time the island burnt was a uh, forest fire. <clears throat> Throughout the years, technology, consumerism uh, evolved. Uh, you know, everything's changing, evolving. A lot of these stories have disappeared. They get lost in uh, our nowadays. Uh, we're just so busy with uh, the way the world is today. These, uh, I think these stories should be resurrected. They mean a lot because I think there's still people that do this. They're strong enough to do it. They want to delve into that world. Personally, I believe in good medicine. I'm, uh, I'm picking up our traditional ceremonies. I got three or four good helpers helping me. And the job is to promote to our people that have suffered a lot of trauma, right? We have, uh, I'll refer to my own community. We have a huge trauma problem where they were afflicted by the residential school system and why they call it schools uh, that's a whole different story the uh, the trauma that the parents brought home and, and grandparents because some of them went early 1900 they never got good uh, teachings as parents and how to be parents so how when you come home and same as self-love, there was no self-love because they got beat out of them, right? They were told that they were not worthy of anything. No. I'm sure everybody knows about uh, the horrors that went on with the residential schools and how, uh, you know, if somebody tells you that you're stupid every day, you after a couple of months, you actually believe you're stupid. If you're told you're no good, you actually believe you're no good. If you're told that you're not worth love, well, then you believe that you're not worth love. So when these parents came home, and in human nature, they, they develop families and have children. They don't know how to teach love, right? They, there's no self-love inside, unless they got some uh, fortunate trauma healings. So the, I believe this is where we stand. The trauma is huge with our uh, Anishinaabe people. We think differently. There was a time uh, where every, all of us were connected to the land. Uh, you sit down with a Nishnabi people, he'll tell you that we all have energies. Everything has energies, the birds, the dogs, the cats. 
your plants, you walk in the bush, they all give up energy. You sit there, we were picking mushrooms last year. And my older brother really freaked me out. He said, Richard, don't pick those mushrooms. They're giving off a different energy. I looked at him like, really? Like what? He said, it doesn't matter. They're giving off a different energy. Leave them. Leave those ones in. So we moved on to another patch. <clears throat> we, we had this connection. And when the uh, colonizers came over, they realized when people have a connection like this, energy connection and true love for inner, inner self love, they can't be controlled, right? This is my version. This is what I do. This is what I think. If they can't be controlled because they have too much love for themselves, well, then we'll have to break that. And they did a pretty good uh, job in trying to break it. Like, uh, myself, lost my native language. My dad was beat uh, to not talk to us. He, his language beat out of him. He knows his language. It's beautiful when he gets together with his uh, brothers and his family, and they speak the language. And I sit there, I pray for it, but he would beat not to teach us. So he was taught, don't teach your children your language. It's no good. Teach them English. And in turn, when my mother tried to teach us her language, dad would take it out on her. So she wasn't allowed to teach us our language. So we lost our language, which is a really big part of our culture. I'm relearning it. It's my job and my duty now as a human being, as a Mishnabi human being, to relearn my language. And I'm, uh, I'm getting laughed at a lot when I try to teach it. <laughs> it's, uh, but it's all good, right? <clears throat> but the one thing that my dad instilled on us is taking care of the land. Uh, when my dad was with us as children, he was never stern, never mean. But he would walk back with you and he'd ask you, why are you doing that to that plant? You know, you're, we're walking to the bush. <clears throat> I'd want to cut trail, like cut trees down, cut branches. He'd say, why are you doing that I plant? That plant don't do anything to you. We don't need a trail here. We're walking through it. Leave it, leave it the way it is. There's other things living here. You know, uh, it's so true. Now, uh, nowadays, uh, they just cut everything, and then they come behind and they spray it. You know, the corporations say the spray is fine. But uh, if we could take a little tour up here, I, I, I could show you what the spray does. And there's vast plots of land that are, uh, they look like that movie Hamburger Hill. It's just desecrated, and the trees are all dead. Like, even the trees that leave behind, they end up dying about three to four years. So there's about a 10-year, I'd say six to 10-year Time frame where that plot of land is dead. It's actually, it's dead. You don't see anything in there. It's, it's like a barren land, right? And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't get to see that because it's in the middle of nowhere, out of sight, out of mind. I guess is what they think, right? And imagine how the little animals feel that are in there. Like they have no nothing left to live on. You know? They get chased out. And as Basil Johnson said in uh, the Manatee book, this is another form of the Wendigo. The uh, I often wonder why somebody needs a 12 bedroom house when it's, they're by themselves in there. I often wonder why uh, you can't live on $18 million a year. You ask for more, for more under bonuses, right? Like, I sit and ponder that. I sit on the river and I say, well, why do they got to keep taking so much? They already got this amount. Like, I, whether I'll ever know the answer to that question, but how does somebody not live on $38 million a year? Happily, it seems like they're not happy. But if you refer back to the window, go, he's always unsatisfied. His hunger is never, it's never taking care of his hunger. His hunger is always there, right? So what do you call it? Unsatisfiable. In relation with the nowadays and the nowadays window, go, this is just what I think. Anyway. So these are a few of the stories. Uh, there's other ones in those uh, the two references that Annie gave you. They're really good. Uh, stories as well. These are the two that I wanted to share with you because they are right from uh, my mother-in-law, which is a true story that she's seen in her lifetime in the bush. And the other one was Jules Tapas, a good healer worker with our community. And I believe these. And it's important for us Anishinaabe people, <clears throat> a lot of us, I remember when I went to school, we came up from the middle of nowhere, right? This, it's bush up here. Like if anybody comes up here and visits, they, they freak out. Like you leave two miles from town, there's no more internet, there's nothing. You're in the middle of nowhere, you're in the bush, right? But when you leave this place as a teenager, 
to go down to the city to educate yourself and start your education path. We think different. We, you know, you get shoved into it, uh, mainstream education, uh, you just fit in, don't worry about it, get in there, do your stuff. Because of our traumas, a lot of us are not uh, foregoing, we're not willing to step out in the middle and say, well, I'd like to ask those questions. So with the trauma that we've incurred over the years, we'd like to sit back. It's uh, something that I believe is changing, which is great. And it's up to things like, uh, and is doing a good job. I believe this is a good thing for people to hear the old stories. A lot of our uh, education is oral, oral stories, oral tradition. Um, like I asked my mom, is this, are these stories written down anyway? She's the Shandi, which is like, uh, what's the matter with you? Nothing was written down. We didn't have to write them down. That's why everybody has to listen. You sit around, you have sharing circles. Everybody listens to this and it gets carried on. And I looked at Oh, all right. So I uh, share these with my nephew, lives with me, and my son. And they're at the age of uh, 20 years old, right? So they, sometimes they want to listen, sometimes they don't want to. So the nights when they really listen, they're, they're, they're right into it. Like, really? Is that shit shifting a thing? So I believe it's still out there. Like, for the people that want to practice that, right? I have a hard enough time being just here in my present now. Never mind shape shifting and flying around. But I'll uh, give you a little break there in case I'm rambling on. Anybody want to ask any questions? Or... Yeah, is there any questions out there? I know um, I love to hear the stories, especially about medicine, even talking, you know, um, you talk about good medicine and bad medicine. And a lot of the stuff that I've read from Basil, I'm really influenced by Basil Johnson's work. He's written a lot of different, um, a lot of books on Nishnabe culture. But he talks a lot about, you know, the truth. And I've tried to teach my students that about, you know, every discipline in, in the university has their own way of looking at the world. That's their truth. So we can compare it to something like statistics where we use, you know, all of these different kinds of, um, you know, statistical algorithms to try to understand the one great truth in the world. And that's what statistics says, right? We're after that that the one truth that exists but for Anishinaabe people and Anishinaabe culture there are many truths and that everyone's life and experience that's their truth and so we can never we'll never have all of it um, there can never be a way to know it all other than to keep sharing our stories and keep getting our perspective out there um, yeah so I certainly um, Glad to, to have you come and tell us these stories because it gives our students and our researchers a chance to think about the world in a different way. Um, I think it's really, really important that your message about going to the land, like the land shifts our perspective. It grounds us um, and it really provides a sense of purpose, um, a sense of belonging and even though it's winter out there and everything seems frozen and asleep, I'm, I've also have the sense of hope that spring is around the corner. Uh, maple syrup is coming. Um, today's Groundhog Day. Do you have any predictions for us? What happened up north? Did the groundhog see a shadow? Well, no, um, it's too frozen up here. It's minus uh, 21 this morning when I woke up. <laughs> but I do have a prediction. I think we're going to get uh, about solid more three weeks of cold weather before it starts warming up that's what i think that's my prediction <laughs> <laughs> yeah it stops now but that's what i predict <laughs> we had, uh, had a really cold winter up here it's steady minus 30 there for about three weeks we just got through a cold spell but yesterday was plus five um and we had rain last night so i get a little uh i was telling you i messaged you last night that in the air I could smell that I could smell spring in the air and it gets me nervous because it's too early way too early and I worry about the yeah. tree I don't want the trees to bud because we might not get any leaves in, in the spring if it buds too early oh cool yeah. we have a question from Natalka uh, she would like to know have you seen the bears which bears the bears I see lots of bears <laughs> actually after uh, after that bear dumped on me I was very fortunate. I never got physically hurt. 
but I suffered, uh, I guess our educated world will say, <laughs> suffered PTSD for a full year. I had the uh, jitters uh, going in and out the bushes. Like I said, dad taught us to never be scared of anything, but for that the year afterwards, uh, a lot of whistling, clanging my minnow pail when I go to check the minnow nets and stuff. It was, it was pretty um, freaky. Like we're working on the, one of the cabins and my brother says, Rick, are you okay? He says it like two or three times. I didn't know that. Finally, I come to him. Like, Matter, man. He's, are you okay, Rick? He says, Yeah, I'm fine. He said, No, you're not. You've been standing there for like that for 15 minutes. I've been talking to you. I'm there, really. I said, Well, I'm okay now. Let's keep going, right? It's funny. Uh, my wife told me too. She's there. Uh, I'd like you to carry this little firearm. It was a small 410. It's a Bushman fire, a 410, little shotgun. I, I need you to carry this for me. I'm going to feel better. So I, I, I did for the first bit, but we're cutting trails. We cut trails like three miles long. So you put the gun down because nobody carries a loaded firearm anywhere. It's just not safe. And I put it down while I'm cutting brush. After about two trips in the bush like this, I'm not carrying it. I got to walk all the way back to get this gun that's supposed to protect me. But I put it on the ground when I first started working anyhow. <laughs> so it wasn't there. But I did do a night lodge, which is one of our ceremonies. And I asked uh, the ancestors that came in because I run a, I opened and run a bear hunting outfitter business. So my question to the ancestors is, am I doing the right thing by opening this outfitting lodge? And uh, during the night lodge, ancestors come in and they're the one that talked to me. She sounded anciently old, like uh, her voice was so old, it was um, know how the inside of your heart that bag that surrounds your heart if you get scared and jolted it kind of shakes that's how it made me feel and i didn't understand her but um at the end when it was all done i asked jules what she was saying and he, he says the elders she said it's okay for you to run your business but as long as you're teaching people about the medicines of the day which is uh probably one of my main focuses when we do have people up visiting the camp we sit and talk about how the bear, he's almost dead when he sleeps during the winter. His, his heart goes down to four beats per minute, which is amazing. And when the bear wakes up in the spring, his kidneys are completely demolished because he doesn't use the bathroom, right? He's the only mammal that completely heals his own kidneys within 30 days, which is an amazing thing. They got doctors trying to research that so maybe they could help uh, humans with kidney dialysis, right? So, uh, to answer to your question, yes, I see lots of bears. The bears are plentiful. Uh, where uh, where my my camp is, it's 120 kilometers south of Hearst. It's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we're beside the Shavlo Game Park, which is one of the biggest game parks in Ontario. It's nice to watch them in nature. Uh, we're not out there just uh, doing harm to all the bears. We, we're a small camp, so we probably harvest four to six bears a season. And... Uh, we actually helped them out. Uh, my mom says, are you still feeding your bear? I said, well, the one way on top of the hill there, yeah, I'm still feeding. I don't know, it's a connection thing for myself. I'm not uh, giving them hamburger helper, if you're wondering. <laughs> but any leftovers from the camp, you know, uh, foods and stuff like that, I take them out and I give them, I give them to him. I don't know if he's the only one eating. But the bears are healthy up here. They're, uh, they're thriving. They're actually one of the ones that are thriving in all the uh, changes to the land. Are they awake yet? I think that's what Natalka was asking if the bears have woken up as opposed to me asking about the colonial construct of groundhogs. Thank you for that. Oh. Thank you for calling. No, no. I appreciate that. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah, it's just like I'm from Wyerton. I've been thinking about pancakes all morning and maple syrup. It's all that stuck in my head, Wyerton Willie. Um, but yeah, have the bears woken up? No, not yet. It's way too cold up here. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, we've had a cold winter. They've even told people to uh, certain blocks of the town they would keep their water running because the frost is going down so deep. Right? Dang, I remember those days. We got a couple yeah. more questions. I just want right. uh, well, to. I twirled go. back too far. Oh, um, so we had a question about um, <laughs> if there is a good side to the Wendigos. So there's like they use the stories to educate people. There are other good stuff. Well, I think you talked about too about um, lots of our stories are used sort of as a taboo, 
like a, a taboo teaching. So um, stories are told in a way to keep people safe, to let them know, um, certainly let the kids know, don't wander away too far from home. But also knowing, right, that just, I feel like there's a huge signal in the in the environment part of it where, right, where Richard talked about, you know, in those howling, the howling wind on those nights, they're telling, especially telling the scarier stories or the Wendigo stories um, to let people know, right, that if it's howling wind, it's freezing cold and we're going to have maybe problems with getting food and we need to be really cognizant of um, living responsibly through the winter. Uh, so there's lots of underlying messages for sure. I think anyway, when I listen to Wendigo stories, um, but as well, I feel like they're also teaching people to stay together, look after each other. And so there is a good, that sort of that good side of that story. But do you have anything that I may be missing about the Wendigo? Well, I, uh, to your satisfying cravings, right? Like that goes with anything. You could base that on the food, gambling, whatever. You got to really keep those in check. You could let them get out of the hand, then you're into addiction. Again. And that's with anything. Like you could buy one motorbike and not be happy with it. You could buy 10 motorbikes and uh, let your kids run around with uh, lots of brand shoes or not as good shoes, right? Because it becomes uh, you're in, into the excess, right? Materialistic items and stuff. So there's another question about um, how these how the stories still circulate in our communities today. Well, you're doing a fine job because uh, it's been a while since I've heard of uh, storytelling. Um, but when I called Jules, he was busy with the uh, mental health crisis of the COVID crisis. Uh, what's going on with COVID? All of our workers leaders are working overtime just to help people with mental health. So he was busy that day. He's like, I can't talk. I'm working with somebody. I'll call, call me back in half an hour. It turned into like two hours later. We finally got a whole one another. And he, he related that story with me of how the wind goes back in the form of uh, addictions. And that took a, that the way he told it, he was more elaborate because he was a first hand storyteller on it. He was, um, it took like two hours in the garage, he was telling me that. But he would go right into depth with the addiction problem and where we are today, trying to help everybody out. So that was a welcome for me of the storytelling. His healing practice and ceremony is starting with an, a long time ago story, right? Which uh, ties everything together. And the more I think, the more I get out, well, pre COVID, the more I was getting out in community, there were communities are starting to um practice those old traditional ways like i was down in wapo island and they have a, a women's group there that grew um from very old corn seed white corn then they had people come out and help them process it like roast it and grind it and then also process it for soup um and during those times, it's when we get lots of different people coming together again, we get to hear those stories, right? I got to tell, like I was, there was a, we were right on the river, on the St. Clair River, and the, the boy's dog was around the shoreline. And I told, I was sitting with old, the old elders, but I told the young boy, I said, you know, you should call your dog back because in the water, there lives Nishibichu. There is this underwater lynx. It, it's kind of a water snake, but he's got kind of this lynx head and he's got arms. And there's also like a, a male sort of female and these other smaller ones. And you really have to stay away from the shoreline and keep your animals away because Mishibichu could grab it and he's hungry. So he'll eat the animal or he could grab you, small child, and eat the child. So stay away from the water's edge. And the elder looked at me and I mean, he just nodded at me, but it was like he patted me on the back. And Later, when the kid grabbed his dog and wandered away to join the crowd again, the elder said to me, it's been a long time since I heard those stories and said to me, keep telling them. And so, you know, again, to that feeling okay for us to share who we really are. And I turned back to the archives. I turned to, you know, I'm an anthropologist, but I work really, really hard to change how anthropology works with community, works with indigenous people because anthropologists have gotten it wrong for so bloody long. And we rely on that as academics, right? We're 
go cite it, source it, show me where you found the information. And if our stories aren't recorded and written down, so thank you for letting us record this. But if we don't start recording and writing this stuff down, we can never source it properly. We can never get the story right. So we're grateful that you came here and you're willing to do this. Lots of people said no to me. I'll let yeah, the audience, well, lots of women said no, they weren't ready that the stories that women carry are, you know, Richard shared some, but again, he's, he's um, curtailing them for us because when women tell stories, boy, um, yeah, it really, animated, yeah. you know, it'll make your hair stand up on your head. Absolutely. My hair standing up thinking going. about that. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and so a part of us telling stories in the winter too, the way I was taught as a, and, and I hung around with a lot of old people when I was a kid, most kids wouldn't hang around with me. Um, so I got stuck hanging around with the old people. And at the time I thought it sucked, but now I know I had a very privileged life and I got to spend all that time with those old people and, and hold their stories for them. Um, so I know I'm privileged now and I'm really grateful. I can sh you know, share that with you here at Concordia. So I'm glad they, they brought me on. Um, but in the winter, when the snow is on the ground, it sort of acts as an insulator where we can tell these stories openly and freely without um, waking or, or calling upon these other than human beings that are extremely powerful. And that whole idea of the snow sort of um, insulating the land, that comes from a very, very old belief system around the beginning of the universe the beginning of human beings, the beginning of all life, it starts with vibration and that, that sound. Um, Eddie Benton Benet writes about this sound. Um, it sounds like a turtle rattle, this ch -ch -ch -ch. that vibration is what sets the world in motion. And so we are, like Richard said, we are beings of energy, right? And so when we're talking, we are creating vibrations and releasing energy. And so we, when we're telling these stories, it's important, it's in the winter because it insulates the vibrations caused and the energy that we're creating by telling these stories. So this is why it's happening in the winter. It's why we talk like this only in the winter. Uh, it's for everyone's safety. Um, but again, doing it online is something very, very new for all of us. And that has to be one way that we can connect, reconnect all of our people, especially the indigenous people who have, right, have become sort of spread around the land you know, colonial policies and, and really have tore our communities apart. Residential schools, like Richard said, addictions, um, poverty, all of this stuff, such harmful impacts to our communities. So people have become really spread out. And so by doing things online like this and opening it up, we get to reconnect all our people back to our communities again. So those are the positives I try to stay with. Um, certainly it's not the old way where we were together huddled in and, and snuggled up and able to lean on each other when we get scared at certain parts of the story, that stuff's still missing. But I'm so glad you lots of you know, are showing your faces because that helps us all connect. And I also yeah. find that when I tell stories, every time I tell it, I learn something new from the story. And so you kind of get a little meandering in the story and it sounds like you're, you know, you're, 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 you know, kind of getting off topic, but it's not. It's because every time we tell the stories, we learn a little bit more. Okay, Richard, I'm going to tell you, get, ask you some more questions because I'll just keep talking. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my problem. I can't, I don't know when to, to shoot it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we have another question here. Uh, until today, I had only heard about Wendigos through white and settler horror stories or books or movies. What do you think settlers are so drawn to Wendigo stories? No problem about turning off your camera. And he also, um, or they're also saying thank you for your time that they appreciate you here. So yeah, what, why are people, why are settlers so drawn to Wendigo stories? Well, I think there's always the draw between like negative and positive or good and bad. Like people, there's a draw to that, and th and that's where that excess comes in. You know, uh, you you try to balance your living, and if you get the question why, sometimes you get pulled to the negative side, right? But I, I'm sure all of us have felt that. Uh, that's where the ego comes in. The ego is uh, somebody that uh, I don't know. Some days I think the ego is uh, could be aligned with the Wendigo. <laughs> so I think when they're attracted to that, they're trying to figure out you know, uh, settlers coming in, new territory or whatnot, what draws them to, why is there that, the other side of the balance? So they look at uh, 
what can be out there. And it basically the negative side, right? The negative energy. I'm sure a lot of us are already know that you push out negative energy and negative energy is gonna come on you pretty fast. You push out positive energy and um, more likely you're gonna get positive energy coming around you. But, and it, it, it works, it, it really does. Yeah, I agree with, with you about that. And I think too that a part, a big part of what all human beings are missing in this, in the kind of world we live in today, we're missing the great mystery in our lives. We're missing that, the great unknown, you know, that the things that we don't understand, we're taught to fear that and, and turn away from it instead of saying, you know, there's this stuff that we don't know about the world that we can't explain but that just creating stories about it of trying to understand or um, trying to highlight that great and beautiful mystery that exists in the world that gives us hope and inspiration. It feeds our spirit, right? And that's a part of who we are as human beings. Certainly, you know, that physical world, we're sort of always stuck in and viewing the world through our eyes, but what happens when we can look at the world through, you know, our heart, what happens when, you know, we listen, you know, not just with our ears, but listen with our, our whole body and our, our spirit and um, like what happens? Yeah, what happens to education? What happens to us? How does that improve our own lives and our own look outlook on life? Uh, but I think the media has had some pretty harmful impacts, though, as well on Indigenous culture. So certainly, you know, um, poltergeist where you, they built the house on the indigenous burial ground and right, and the evil um, or right. The other thing I, I was impacted by this with my own work was those old recordings that were, you know, the, the tag on them in the museum said that these were sacred medicine songs and stories. And immediately what came to my mind was, I'm the anthropologist, right? So immediately into my mind comes Indiana Jones and he opens up, you know, the, the lost ark and evil comes out. And I, so I said, I don't want to play these. What if I make something bad in the world happen? And I spent a long time talking with my family and my elders about that idea that somehow I wasn't special enough or I wasn't sacred enough to interact with the sacred or to hear the sacred stories or hear the sacred songs. And we spent a long time just talking about that as a family, talking about with my own elders, and then coming at it from a community perspective. So lots of people were involved with addressing that idea of the sacred and how things are, again, like outside of some people's knowledge. That I think is a colonial um, artifact that, you know, it, having a long influence of the church in our lives having someone like the priest, so I'm Catholic, so having the priest who is the person who is connected to God. And for me to connect to God, I connect through the priest. So I'm not sacred enough as the priest is. And so that kind of idea has translated somehow through that word sacred. And those are some of the things that I tried to address in my course. And I teach a course called Sacred Stories. And that idea that we are all sacred and that that's why we need to interact with that other side of life, that great mystery that exists, because we're a part of that. And that's what's going to inspire hope and get us through these long winters. Boy, I talk a lot. I did it again. Sorry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Can I share one? It's a good story. I want to share a good story. The, um, we used to go to my mom's uh, family in Manitoulin Island. Huge family. My mom's family had 24 kids, right? So uh, when we got down there, there's probably, we had enough to make three lines to play uh, street hockey. There's so many of us cousins around. But I was at the age where I was in between. So like a group of the cousins would take off. I was like two years behind and then two years ahead of the younger one. So I was kind of like by myself. I was feeling kind of bummed out, sad that they took off on me, right? All these other cousins. My Uncle John was visiting. And I had an old kid's harmonica, red and white sitting there kicking the dust because I got left behind, right? I'm not allowed to go with the older kids. And he said, what's the matter, my boy? I said, oh, nothing. You know, you don't voice yourself. You're taught not to voice it, right? So he grabs the harmonica and he starts playing it. And, I, and I'm thrilled that he knows how to play this harmonica. And he's doing it really well with a kid's Fisher Price harmonica. I said, I didn't know you knew how to play that, Uncle John. He said, yeah, I, I learned how to play this long time ago. He said, I'm going to tell you something. 
and I'm looking at him. He said, there's going to be a time in your life where you're going to be walking by yourself. You'll be all alone. You'll feel like you're going to be all alone. With him. And you're going to see something out of the ordinary, like a little flower or a, or, or a money or some, something that's not supposed to be there. And you'll remember that I love you. And I looked at him like, and this is the era where love was not really talked about. Your parents didn't tell you, I love you. Really. You might got a, a wink from your dad every now and then or a, or a little pat, right? But you never got, I love you. And I was kind of shocked. And So years later, my Uncle John's been gone for a long time. And we we're out uh, hunting moose in the fall. We put a good day on. We, we put about eight to 12 miles on our legs up here when we were out hunting moose. I was coming back and I was having a hard week at work. You know, finances, work, everything was down. I was feeling down about a lot of stuff. I'm on my way back and now I'm double down because I didn't get onto any moose. So I'm like, okay, what did I do wrong? How come, uh, what did I forget? What did I do? And I'm walking back to a swamp and it's all fall time. So everything's like dying, right? It's all uh, yellow, brown. And I stop. I want to drink water. So I go in my bag and I, I got a little zip left. I'm kneeling down in the grass and in the middle of this big swamp, there's a red flower about maybe the size of my cut up thumb here, peeking out. And I'm looking at it. I'm the holy cow, Uncle John. Thank you so much. And it gave me enough energy to walk back to the truck, to change my mood all around, talk to my brothers about it. And they're like, yeah, we were wondering what's going on. You're not voicing yourself. It always makes me cry talking about it, right? And uh, it, it, these kind of stories are... When Annie was saying the, the great mystery or the spirit side, it, it does exist and we're energies of it. You know, our teachings tell us this and they have to come back. Uh, they have to resurface. I don't think they ever died, but uh, they were hidden or locked away, uh, uh, shushed kind of. So they have to resurface. And I'm, I'm glad I took part in this today. I was nervous like crazy to, to say yes. <laughs> no, you're doing, you're doing great and you're not done yet because we have more questions. So yes, Richard is an awesome musician um, and no, he can't play a song because we're going to answer some more questions. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to go check out his YouTube channel. No, I don't even know if you have one yet. Um, but yeah, there are, he's out there playing guitar for sure on video. Um, so we have a question about the shaking tent ceremony that you mentioned. And mm -hmm. uh, Courtney would like to know, um, do you have to be invited to the shaking tent or do you already have to be like, is it only medicine people? Could you tell us anything more about the shaking tent? My knowledge of the shaking tent, it's a one person ceremony and the medicine man, uh, he's the one that goes in or the medicine lady. And that's another thing we have to change. A lot of the terms are men, men, men. And no, it's not like that. My mother is a third, third generation medicine woman. And, uh, I'd love to hear to tell, share her stories about how uh, midwifery did. My grandmother birthed almost 70 babies in her time. You know, there's more medicine women, uh, just there is medicine men. But the shaking tent is a one person ceremony. It's a small tent. I've never uh, personally visualized one. I've never been near one, but these are the stories I've told. Uh, Jules conducts them once in a while. And when Jules goes in, he gets his whole family and uh, the great mystery, the spiritual side, he'll call out. And through uh, modern day technology, we, we text everybody or message everybody that believes in this. Uh, I carry my own pipe. So if he calls out, I'm going into shaking tent. I'll go into my garage. I have a little wood stove there and I'll go into prayer. I'll, I'll pray for him for a safe outcome. And uh, it, it, it's amazing how many actually come together. So it's not just him going into ceremony in the shaking tent. He probably had a few hundred with him. And uh, like he, he's telling his mother, when he starts, his mother doesn't stop praying until she hears that he's out of it. Because it's a pretty powerful thing, right? They could, uh, I know in the night lodge, uh, if they don't come out of it, uh, sometimes we lose them. They gain the spiritual uh, realm, which is death in the physical world. Right? But yeah, that's uh, my knowledge of it. I have never gone into one. I have never conducted one. I'm, I'm not there yet. I think that's really important for all of us to hear that, you know, um, even when there is a ceremony going on, even if you're not there in person, that you're at home in ceremony and joining on a spiritual level. So I hear that often from other people. So I have a, a very good friend um, in Oneida and 
she often um, just sometimes, you know, quite actually, I'll say it, quite often doesn't feel comfortable in big crowds. And so when they're having their strawberry ceremonies, she's also participating, but she's doing her ceremony at home. And that's, that's still good. That's an excellent way to keep our, our ceremonies and our traditions going. It doesn't always have to be all of us together physically. We can connect from long distances on a spiritual level. And we do have stories about people who could do that. We had medicine people who, um, I would hear the stories as they would talk into a kettle. And so medicine people would go into ceremony often like I think is very similar to a shaking tent, but there would be a kettle there. Um, and the medicine man could ask questions into the kettle and it would somehow connect to another, maybe another community far away, another medicine person who's in conversation with them. Maybe it's a different dimension. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know where this connection was leading to, to the spirits, to whatever. But my grandfather, when he told me the story of witnessing this, um, he said he could hear voices coming out of the kettle. He could hear a village in there. He heard a dog barking and kids playing. So it's an incredible, incredible, powerful connection that our medicine people have. Um, and not everybody has that high level connection, even though we are all connected. Um, you know, like I said, and like we've been saying all along, our medicine people have an extremely intense power um, and we have to be, be really respectful of that all the time. Um, so certainly if you get invited to a shaking tent, please attend. I know in Toronto at Missional Bay Health, they do perform in the city, they perform shaking tent ceremonies. On their website, they do have an, they had an archived section or a resources section and in that section on Nishnabe Health, I found an academic paper on the shaking tent ceremony. So you can go and look for that. You can read about it. Um, and this person is just really their observational, um, like sort of an observational study of what they witnessed when they were in, um, in attendance at the shaking tent. Uh, so I just wanted to share this kind of suggestion with you from one of one of the um, attendees that who suggested that maybe our communities could start thinking about like sort of an environmental center. But I think I, I get what you're talking about more that's, you know, um, connecting, you know, people who've experienced trauma, connecting them with the land um, and with ceremony. And that is happening. So there's Turtle, Turtle Lodge out in Manitoba that connects youth um, back to ceremony. Um, but there are lots of other places. Um, and certainly our universities are starting to move in that direction too. You can check out, I think it's going to be called in the language though, but it will translate to grandma's house. And I think that's coming out of University of Guelph. I saw that in the news uh, in the spring. <coughs> and then just want to clip down here and see if there's any more questions out there. Oh, okay. So there's, um, it says, I know that a lot of knowledge has been lost from colonialism. However, do you think that some of that knowledge can be refound or at least that new knowledge and traditions can be learned from the land? or the community um can they be created can we make new ones can we create new ones can we bring old ones back i, th I think the old ones will come back because almost all of our ceremony and teachings are spiritual based right so even if they're creating new ones once you get in tune with the energies the energy and cr while creator will tell you if you're doing it wrong or if you're doing it right like you'll be guided i've been uh I've been experimenting too. Like, uh, am I doing this right? I question myself, am I doing this right? Nobody's really sat down with me. But I'll sit down and smudge and I'll pray. And I'll have my bundle there, which is, uh, our bundle is never ours, right? It's given to us to uh, help people out and we pass it on when it's over. I believe it will, uh, everything's changing all the time. We get older every day. Uh, everything's changing. Everything's evolving. So with the stories and the teachings, with the community, we have to reach out to the ones that are left. Um, I'm 49. I'm almost there to be an elder. Another six years. I think they say 55. You're an elder. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, like, it's my responsibility now to reach out to these older ones. Then some of them have been traumatized so much that they don't want to speak out. They're they're shy or scared to speak out. So it's my responsibility to, to meet with them, to make them feel comfortable, to tell them the direction I'm going. Uh, the education of keeping it alive, 
the education of letting people know that, yes, you're worthy of self-love and it's in our teachings, you know, the connection with energy. To let them know that they're so comfortable to tell me the old ones that they remember, right? I remember uh, with the blast or sickness going on in our community and uh, scare of the COVID, uh, I think it was a common flu come in. Everybody was getting sick and the, the, the fear just went bananas. And uh, I dreamt of a tea long time ago, probably my son's 21, 12 years ago. He was in grade school. And I dreamt of this tea. So I went to talk to my dad about it and said, Dad, uh, what kind of medicinal properties are in the red willow? And my dad says, I don't really know, he says. But, you know, the moose eat it like crazy in the winter. That's what they survive on, among other trees. But they eat that red willow like crazy. So it's got to be powerful stuff. He says, oh, yeah, but the old guys, when they used to paddle the river, the old guys would uh, make tea out of that. And they'd eat whatever, what was steep. They'd take it and they'd eat all of that, he says. So it's got to be pretty powerful. But I don't remember. They never really told us what it does or whatnot. So when I drank my tea, we had uh, cedar, red willow. There's a chega and our weekend root. I don't know the the real name. We call it weekend in Ojibwe. I don't know. Really. Wheat flag. Is it? Okay. Mm. All uh, sweet flag root. And you just told me. <laughs> so uh, that was my tea, right? And uh, I made a big pot of that like a huge pot and I forced my son to drink two big mason glasses and we all drank it for like three or four days and the school principal actually called me he said Richard we'd like to know what you're giving your son at home because all the kids are sick at school he said what are you doing he's the only one that's not sick I said well if you could promise me and this is where I was at my time in my walk right I said if you could promise me that you're not going to make fun of it condemn it well then I'll share it with you and he's a, he didn't really have a response. I said, we've been laughed at so, for so many years. Do I really want to share this with you? He said, well, it's okay if you don't want to. He said, we're just interested because all the other kids are sick. I said, yeah, Robitussin doesn't work all the time. I said, oh, you're not. Well, like, there's certain things that you should take from the land. And it's given to us. It's free. Like, you go out and thank the creator and it's there. Take the time to prepare properly and, and use it, right? And this was given to me in dream form. And I uh, talked to a medicine woman in uh, Wakwemakong, Tina Ishpaki, and her name is, and she described the medicinal properties of the tea. And uh, I was uh, really impressed. She's there. She tells me, I'm impressed with your dreams. Whoever gave you, whatever ancestors gave you this tea in dream form, it, it was meant for a reason. And uh, I think you should share it. So uh, I can share it with Anne. She could post it someplace for everybody to take a gander at it and the medicinal properties that comes along with it. That's, you know what, you really, and certainly there's the dreaming part, but the other part is you have to go and talk to like a medicine person or an elder to understand what that means, because I too had a dream. Um, and it, it was, uh, it's a Christmas tree, right? And so they, the, and so I kind of asked around, I'm not really hardcore, but I kind of asked around and they're like, oh yeah, well, when you dream about that stuff, you're supposed to make it into a tea. So I just went in around and I lived in the city in London. So I just went, mm, where should I go? I don't know. Here's some nice trees. I was in a graveyard. So I cut the Christmas tree branches and I went home. I was, I was making this tea and I was like, gee, it smells like fart in here. I said, oh, maybe it's some kind of medicine is going to help your bum. I said, so I kept cooking and my phone rang. It's my cousin from up north here from the res. And he says, uh, what are you doing? I said, I had this dream and now I'm making this tea. And I said, but gee, it smells like fart. And he said, what kind of tree are you using? I said, the Christmas tree. And he says, doll, you know, there's 30 different kinds of that kind of tree. And I was just <laughs> like, turned off the stove, back to doing research. So you have to be careful because the tree I ended up using was an yeah. English, English spruce. So not the tree that comes from here and probably why it smelled like fart. But uh, yeah, always important to check with your medicine people. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Mm, if you know just there's a question about um, indigenous cultural experiences and I would just recommend that if you're new to learning about the culture my first recommendation is volunteer with an indigenous organization near you start making some friends reach out um, offer your supports if you have special skills special research skills our communities need that so please volunteer 
Um, another thing you can start doing is start attending more Indigenous events. So come on back to storytelling here. I'll do my best to host more events, especially we need some women's events because those stories really are great. And then we heard Richard say as well that they're pretty deadly stories. So we've got to get to work on that. Um, but yeah, and just so now I forgot what I was talking about when I started talking about women's stories. What was I saying? Were you guys listening? <laughs> what are you guys listening? <laughs> Everybody yeah. just started. How do you reach out to be involved more with the indigenous people? Is where you start oh, yeah, off. yeah, and then go to a powwow. So the coolest place I think to learn, like, and really get your feet wet, is go to a powwow. You could see the regalia, so all the different kinds of um, styles of clothing that each of the nations wear. Um, you can see our different dance styles, our different songs. Um, there's food, there's crafts, there's art, um, and there's family and friends. And so the Powell is probably the best place, um, after those other things I suggested, is really a really, really fun place to get involved. Um, so yeah, just reach out and, and you know, um, certainly in Montreal, you can always check out the Montreal Native Friendship Center. Um, but there are other organizations that I'm not quite familiar with yet, but I'm learning. Um, but yeah, and also, um, okay, I just want to keep going down the line here. I want to make sure I got all of the, all of the questions. Oh, they'd like to know what you trap. Oh, well, okay. Uh, our main animal that we used to trap for a, a monetary or dollar value was the pine marten. That was, um, I think most furriers use the pine marten in uh, just about everything they make, right? And then the, the beaver was a mandatory animal that we had to trap. That's uh, uh, mandatory by the government. That's for road erosion, uh, washouts of the train tracks and stuff like that. So my trap, my trap line is not that big in square miles. So I'm mandated by the government. I have to get 24 beaver on my trap line every season or 75%. There's always a go-to, right, <laughs> for the people that don't want to give her. So, uh, and my brother's trap line is bigger. He's got to get 52 beavers because it's bigger square mile radius. So, the beaver has to be trapped. Uh, they give you, um, they give you leeway if you got a short back that year, or if you're a family crisis, you could have somebody else come in and trap for you. Then uh, the other one we trap, uh, the lynx cat. I think that's a, uh, that's um. Uh, very luscious fur. Uh, I use a lot of links. I home tan my own links too to put on the mittens and stuff. Uh, mink, wild mink, otters, muskrats, uh, foxes. I I don't trap wolves. I find them too much of a beautiful animal. Um, they're really, really, really brilliant animals. Uh, the only way I'll uh, we get on them is if the wolf pack gets too big, right? So if you have a trapping zone. Six to eight wolves is perfect because the, the wolves are so beautiful and smart, they'll only uh, get rid of your sick or diseased animal. And when they get above 10 bigger packs, uh, 15, 17, then they're, uh, they're eating like crazy because the wolf is he's so uniquely beautiful. A wolf will live on its all its fat in his body for over 30 days. He'll consume all his fat before he has to eat, right? So when the pack gets that big, they're always eating because the time, the time is uh, for the 30 days mixed in between the pack. But a uh, small pack, uh, you want them on your zone, they'll uh, get rid of sick and diseased animals. There's a purpose for everything. And uh, well, well, sometimes, unfortunately, you get other animals in there, but primarily the pine mark is what the monetary value was. That's That paid your gas and your time to go out on the trap line and, uh, and the beaver. The government, uh, reading on the bottom, Lori Collins says, is the government involved in the trap lines yesterday? They're all, uh, Unfortunately, you can't just uh, decide to pick up and go uh, trapping on the land. You have to get a government license, uh, take a government course. We all know how the government works. They want a little piece of the pie and uh, everything is licensed and mandated. I'm a licensed trapper. I did take my course and uh, my trap line is a registered indigenous trap line, but it's still uh, a sub branch of the government. So I still have to report all the animals I harvest on it, report back to them. And we also fill out yearly animal of reports of, uh, of are we seeing any animals? They didn't like my last report. I said, how could I see animals when there's no more trees left? There's no more animals there, right? And they, they kind of like just stopped 
talking about it after. They don't want to know anything because they, they clear cut my trap line. Like, it's kind of sad if you see it, but uh, you know, what can you do? So those are the animals that we primarily trap. Uh, in the winter. Have you ever seen any like animals that don't fit what they're supposed to look like? So, uh, so I mean, near us, we're near the nuclear plant and in the Sydenham River, we had the three-eyed fish. Really? Ooh, no, yeah. not up here. No, uh, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> they got the windigo coming after me. <laughs> Never yet. But no, uh, like for out of territory, we've had wolverines come down in the last few winters, and they're primarily not in our zone, right? They're further north. And all the old guys are saying, I wonder what's making the wolverines come down. Like when animals move, it's something going on with their, uh, with their, their zone, right? But uh, other than that, we had a, a bear this summer. He looked like a, what do you call a hyena? He, uh, and if you want, really want to go deep, he kind of looked like a shapeshifter because with the more sun, the blonder he got. So his, his legs are black. And then on the back, he's blonde. Like probably, I'll send you a picture of it. It's pretty cool. But uh, the research behind it is the more sun you get, to eat, it's a berry. They're calm, more common than we thought. This is the first time I've seen one out in the wildlife. But he'll get blonder with the more sun that he gets. So as the uh, summer goes on, he starts to return back to being more black. Pretty cool. Wow. Oh, then we just got one, some, one more question here about the furs. So who, who buys the skins? Is it the Hudson's Bay? Uh, I don't think Hudson Bay exists anymore. That we that we had a fur harvesters association in North Bay. With COVID, everything took a, a big hit. I think they're actually closed. And there was one in Winnipeg. It was uh, it was a big fur buyer. And, uh, with COVID, everything went down. Like uh, my trap line now, I use it more for ceremonial purposes and traditional purposes because it's not feasible to go out on the land anymore. It's, you know the price of gas and everything else. It doesn't it doesn't pay, right? So I'm transforming my trap line, uh, my cabins. We started land-based healing camps last summer. It was, uh, it was really welcomed and uh, people needed it. I think more people need it. Because uh, uh, the government, as with the government, they want to make sure you're using what they allocate you, right? And if we're not trapping it, then we've got to be showing that we're going to be using it for something else. And that's uh, why I'm doing it that way. I just talked about your, um, his hunting camp. Um, you can find information about that or maybe plan or organize, try to organize a visit up there. And you can find that uh, it's called the Wesley Bull Guides. You can find them on Facebook and on Instagram. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, great. All right. If there's any last minute questions out there, folks, anybody want to ask in person? I feel like I'm bossing our, our session around by asking all the <laughs> questions. If there's any last minute questions? I see it's you, Graham. So awesome. Graham. I am bossy. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, lots of thanks out there. Lots of me gwetches. Mm -hmm. Okay, last call, folks, for questions. Okay, so I just wanted to say chi me gwetch to you, Richard, for coming and for taking a risk to come and do something in a new way, share our stories, um, get it out there. I, I did see a mom with their with their child listening in, too. That makes me so happy that people have brought their kids. Um, to listen in um and i just uh yeah i'm just grateful that you came and definitely gonna get your mom roped in we, his mom went by earlier and I, I really wanted her to stay but uh she had to go make cake uh, yeah. <laughs> um next on tuesday february 8th at 12 noon here again on zoom our next storyteller um is concordia's very own emilio wawati he is from Kittigan, ZB and Barrier Lake First Nations. And he's going to be in to tell us um, some pike stories. And he's going to, I think he's got some pike bones to show us too. So it's going to be super exciting. Uh, so don't forget next Tuesday, February 8th at 12 noon here on Zoom. And you can find the link on Concordia's events page. Okay, so thank you again, Richard. Uh, shout You're out welcome. to the Thank you much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Arts and Science. <laughs> shout out to the School of Community Public Affairs and shout out to Codes. Um, oh, I got a little hand. Tammy, take it away, Tammy.
I uh, I just asked uh, if the recording would be available because I saw you were recording today so that I could show it to uh, my daughter. Because like I told you last time, she wasn't here. So uh, yeah. she was disappointed. She's like, ah, but I'm at school. So yeah, I don't know where it would be available. Is it on the same link as the uh, uh, session like where it was on Concordia or? I won't, if you can. It's, oh, it's making it capitalized. All, my email is all little letters. So email me and I'll send you a copy. Cool. Um, it's not a big B. It's all. It's a little B. It's just it keeps auto correcting. Uh, the other thing I can do is I'll reach out to Codes, which is the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling, and I'll ask them if they wouldn't mind um, archiving this link for people to access for the next little bit. Um, and I'm sure they'd be um, willing to do that. They're good people over at Codes and researchers. If you need access to anything that helps you with uh, storytelling, interviewing, reach out to Codes. They have a lot of equipment you can borrow, and even rooms you can use and um, access. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I was. Uh, this is actually Richard's first time zooming, and so we met yesterday. We had a bit of a practice session. Um, and, yeah, so you did really, really great, Richard. So amazing. So he just found the chat. <laughs> yeah, I know. I see all the button, the numbers on the bottom. I said, I wonder what this is. <laughs> oh, I only told him about the participants button. Oh, I'll have to add that to my list yeah that was great okay everyone have a wonderful day and i'm so grateful that you chose to come and spend with us today so take care bye bye everyone bye everyone